Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on returning guest, Aaron Smith-Levin. Aaron, welcome to the show. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Hey, Aaron, I really got to say at the beginning that I love your live streaming you've been doing online. Thank you. Certainly I've been getting questions about Marty Rathbun. Uh, like you, I've been watching it with interest. And what, what's your general observation of the video series so far? Well, I'll tell you, the first two or three videos, um, even though I was disappointed that he had, he had chosen to uh, uh, seemingly side back with the church, I wasn't terribly offended by the content uh, to the degree that it seemed like he was at least saying things that were probably true to him, meaning it, it seemed like he was probably at least speaking his own words. Um, there's just no doubt in my mind in the last, what, I don't know, 25, 30 videos he's done, there, there, he's no longer speaking his own words. He, he, he's reading a script from the church. He's reading the church's talking points. He's going down a list of bullet points he's been given to cover. And um, it's just really uh, disturbing and, um, and kind of disgusting. And um, I know a lot of people have said, well, you know, this really is the same Marty that we've seen all along. It's just that for a while he was on our side and now he's not. And we shouldn't be particularly um, surprised or disturbed by this. Um, but I do find it disturbing because I've actually, I actually can't say that I have seen somebody completely turn on everything they claimed to stand for and everyone they claimed to have as a friend. I, I, I cannot, as I sit here, think of any other example that I've seen in my life of something like that actually happening. And uh, it is pretty disturbing to witness. Yes, it's unprecedented in, in uh, our circles to see someone flipped like that, turned, yeah. whatever you want yeah. to say. What's interesting to me, his videos are now on a Church of Scientology website. Yeah. Okay, so the Church of Scientology is using him as supposedly a credible source. So yeah. my questions are, are Marty Rathbun's videos credible? Is Marty credible? Well, um, well you, you put up a, a fantastic... Um page on the website Scientology Money Project that, that addresses this, and I, and I cited that today on Twitter. You, and, and I've taken a moment to examine this myself internally of, okay, well, am I taking someone who before I was saying was credible, credible and now I'm saying he's not credible just because he's on the other side of the fence? And, and I asked myself, well, how, how has this changed for me personally? And I, I think the difference is that before, when Marty was talking about, um, you know, when Marty was ostensibly out of the church, talking about issues that happened in the church, um, he wasn't really engaged in character assassination. He was simply imparting, at least from what I can recall, facts and incidents and things that happened. And what I'm seeing him do now is, well, let's take what he said about Mike Rinder. Mike Rinder is the closest thing to a best friend that Marty has ever had while in or since leaving Scientology. And he's doing these videos, and he's, you know, he just calls him Rinder, like he's a fucking stranger or something. Yeah. Rinder. Yeah. And he's making broad, sweeping generalities like, you know, gosh, it's been over 10 years since Rinder left the Sea Org, and he hasn't held down a, a job in the, in, in the entire time. He's just been uh, working for people who will give him money um, to talk against Scientology. And I'm sitting here going, you know, Marty Rathbun knows damn well that Mike spent the last two years working for me full-time in my investment research business. And uh, I would characterize that as holding down a real job. I certainly wasn't paying Mike to speak out against Scientology. My, I was paying Mike to work full-time with me, 40, 50, 60 hours a week in my business. Um, and yet, and Marty knows that. And yet he will sit there and just make generalized character assassinations against Mike that he obviously knows aren't true. And what's fascinating to me about this is that he's not even responding to an attack. Mike has never attacked Marty. Mike has never publicly criticized Marty. Mike has never done anything to put Marty on the defensive or given, give, uh, given him a reason to go on the attack towards Mike. The only reason somebody like A. Marty would be attacking somebody like A. Mike is if they were being given talking points that were serving somebody else. And as far as I can see, that's exactly what was happening, what is happening. So that's kind of a long-winded answer. You said, is Marty credible? Well, as I say here right now, no, he's not credible. Because it's not just that he's countering what other people are saying. He's contradicting what he himself has said publicly about pretty much all of these incidents that he's now referring to. He's contradicting himself. And his videos don't even include some sort of a caveat to explain why he's reversing himself. You know what I mean? It's not like he's 
It's not like he's trying to own up to having lied or something. He's just pretending like he never said any of these things that he's now completely contradicting. I mean, it really is a phenomenal thing to witness. It, it certainly is, and the Church of Scientology itself is not credible. And let me tell you why. I'm going to play some video here. Tommy Davis, who yeah. was the international spokesman for the Church of Scientology. I'm going to play this video of what Tommy said about Marty Rathbun in an interview with the Tampa Bay Times. Truth Rundown? Yeah. So, so let's just roll this. Yeah. I understand. Here's the thing. If you came to me and said we were talking to Marty Rathbun and, and he's left the church and he's talking about some of his disagreements and so on and so forth, and you never brought up anything about physical violence, I never said anything about David Miscavige beating this person, that person, whatever, I wouldn't bring it up. I wouldn't. Even though I knew it would annihilate his credibility, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. But he's the one who's saying that David Miscavige beat these people, and he's saying that David Miscavige beat the exact same people that he beat. And that's what pisses me off. Because this guy is a fucking lunatic, and I don't have to explain how or why he became one, or how it was allowable. The fact is, is he's saying David Miscavige did what he did. Okay, I'll, I'll cut it there, Aaron. Now, okay. Tommy Davis says that, and these are the, Tommy Davis's words, the Church of Scientology's words, not mine, that Marty Rathbun is a fucking lunatic. Right. Okay, now that's on the record. <laughs> right. And now the Church of Scientology is using a fucking lunatic, quote-unquote, to argue against this fiction that they've invented called the ASC, the Anti-Scientology Community. Yeah. And, and so, to me, this looks like a complete propaganda, disinformation. It reeks of, it reeks of desperation because of the Church of Scientology. It hasn't had a spokesman since Tommy Davis left. Bizarrely, Marty, who it's called a violent psychopath, a fucking lunatic, you just go down the list, right? Yeah. And, and we both watch them throw everything at Marty. You know, I mean, his arrest for drinking. I mean, well, they said he was mentally unsound because his mother had electroshock therapy while Marty was in the womb. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of things they were saying about him when they when they considered him a bad guy. Right. Yeah. So. It depends on how you want to look at it. I mean, at the time, when they were saying all these horrible things about Marty, I was of the view, well, that they're just lying. I mean, we know the church will, you know, create all sorts of propaganda to throw at whoever it is they consider to be an enemy. And that's fine. From my point of view at that time, they were issuing propaganda against him. From the church's point of view at that time, let's give them the benefit of the doubt of saying that they, well, it sounds ridiculous, but that they were telling the truth. And it's kind of like... But that, see, that's subjective. I think they're lying. They think they're telling the truth. But now they're reversing themselves. So it just comes, well, were you lying then or are you lying now? You can't call him a violent psychopath and a psychotic and mentally unstable and then use him as a credible source to take down other critics. <laughs> I mean, it's so dumb. No, and that's the point I made on my recent Scientology Money Project post. Is Marty right. Rothman a psychopath? You know, which story is Scientology sticking with? Right. So Scientology cannot have it both ways. It cannot have current hate pages up on Marty attacking as a violent like psychopath, a perjurer, a man who engaged in obstruction of justice. Right. And even while citing as a credible source to attack Leah Remini, Mike Rinder, you, my wife, me. You go down the list. That's right. Right. Okay. So it's sort yeah. of like Scientology, which... David Miscavige, actually, I would refer this question to you, COB. Which story are you sticking with? Is he a fucking lunatic, as Tommy Davis said? Your words, not mine. Is he a violent psychopath? Is your pages that are still up on the Internet? Right. Okay, now, if he's these things, then he cannot be credible. And why is he up on a Church of Scientology website if he's if he's such a monster why, right. are, why are you using him to dead agent leah remini or anyone else right and for a moment let's examine um the context in which tommy davis uttered those words who he was uttering them to and why you said it was something to do with the tampa bay times yes i, I can't recall I, if i recall correctly and you can correct me if i'm wrong 
it wasn't just an interview Tommy was giving to those to the Tampa Bay Times. He was visiting the offices for the purpose of trying to discredit Marty to the extent that the Tampa Bay Times would not use him as a source, <laughs> right? So he's sitting there saying it is unethical journalism. You know, you're, you're not upholding the journalistic standards by using this person as a source because X, Y, and Z, right? Correct. correct. You're correct. And then they turn around and want to use him as their own source once they can finally brought enough pressure to bear upon him to break him or, or whatever the hell it is that got him to do these videos. Yeah, and this is the schizophrenia. You know, uh, uh, for people who are listening, New Time Scientology watchers, you can go to a site called whoismartyrathbun.com. And there you'll see the church, and this is still up in the Church of Scientology, has it up. They call him a violent psychopath, Marty Rathbun, Journey to Nowhere. Violent psychopath, cult militia leader, liar, coward, perjurer, criminal. You know, it, it just goes down. And over against this, these videos where Marty's supposedly describing this narrative that doesn't right. exist. Because, you know, yeah. uh, the things that go on out here are organic. There's no centralized command. And this mm -hmm. was the same mistake that Scientology made with Anonymous. They assumed there was some centralized command post in an organization and it was funded. But do you really think they assumed that or is that just the propaganda they tell to the inside to explain where all these people are coming from? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's propagandistic. But on the other hand, Scientology tends to think there's always an external enemy that's being, that's being funded. L. Ron Hubbard had... 12 British bankers. There was Interpol. Mm -hmm. There was Smirsh. Right. And then there was psychiatry. Then there, were the, mm -hmm. then there was the planet Farsec from where all the uh, psychiatrists came, you know, millions of years ago. Right. So because the, the church has really been exposed in Going Clear the Book, the documentary, Leah Remini's show, Tony Ortega's blog, the work you're doing, Aaron, the work I'm doing, and, and so many other people are doing. Jefferson Hawkins, you know, Counterfeit Dreams was one of the opening salvos. Uh, the work Anonymous has done. They don't have a good response. Right. And generally, the, they're, a, they're a walking PR disaster. You know, you use the term foot bullets. Yeah. So now they're in this bizarre, surreal situation where they have someone. And, you know, I'm going to I have a, a video queued up. OK, audio. Mm -hmm. This is from December 2014. Marty Rathbun is being deposed by Church of Scientology attorney Bert Dixler. Ted Babbitt's on the phone in the Luis Garcia case. And, okay. I, I, and I, I'm going to let our, our listeners get a feel for this. Bert Dixler is going to ask Marty about David Miscavige. Do you write articles about the Church of Scientology? I have it in some time. You regard yourself as a critic of the Church of Scientology? No. Regard yourself as an enemy of the Church of Scientology? No. Regard yourself as an enemy of David Miscavige? No. Is that somebody you dislike? Not necessarily. Is that somebody you publicly criticize? I publicly disclose facts about him. You publicly criticize him, sir? I don't know if you want to call it criticism. That's your characterization. Have you likened him to um, famous uh, criminals? Perhaps you're not sure. It would be a good. It would. It would be a good. It would be a good analogy. Joe, so you don't have any ill will toward him, correct? No. Okay, you never, for example, uh, likened him to Adolf Hitler. True. Well, that's two different questions. Just to, your intonation makes it sound like it's two different things. And um, the answer to the, liking him to Adolf Hitler, absolutely yes. Okay. Uh, uh, but that Marty Rathbun has compared David Miscavige to Adolf Hitler. Joseph mm -hmm. Stalin and the Ayatollah Khomeini. <laughs> now, now, okay, so Miscavige is Adolf Hitler. And yet the church is hosting him on its own website that's paid for with tax exempt dollars. How right. psychotic is that, Aaron? I know. I know. So, um,. You know, I think you, you know that I've said that Marty may may have taken money, may not have taken money, but 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 in my opinion, the the factor of money doesn't explain what he's doing. That's too simple. He could have gotten money if he continued his lawsuit. Um, the truth is, he doesn't need money. Uh, 
He lives a simple life, and his wife has a good job. So even if the church gave him money, which it could have done, it doesn't really explain what's happening here. What are your, what's your thought on that? You know, the consensus that he made a deal with the church is one, is one possible explanation. Now, what's very revealing is he made a, a comment some time ago that um, after his, his wife, Monique, was criticized for dropping her lawsuit, and she, that people would rue the day they did that. Mm -hmm. So is he motivated by vengeance because he felt offended? I mean, yeah, like offended by the, uh, you know, the, the coverage and the comments on like Tony's blog, for example. Yes. Because um, to be honest, I don't know what else there is to be offended by. Um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe, you know, rue the day. I, I always wondered like, God, Tony, like, I'm, I'm not Tony. Marty, like, it really is a threatening thing to say to somebody. You will rue the day. Well, well you're threatening someone when you say that. I mean, that's how I see it. Um, it's just that everything he's doing right now is attacking people that have done nothing to him. Amy Scobie, are you kidding me? Amy Scobie's done nothing to Marty Rathbun. Um, Robert Omblod, Mike Rinder, these people have never even publicly criticized Marty Rathbun. Uh, Amy Scobie and Matt Pesh had come out in defense of Marty, even after his first few videos. Saying, you know what, we, we're not going to read too much. You know what, like they literally defended him. They didn't agree with him. They just defended him. And, and, and yet, so even that doesn't explain it, you know? No, and, and that doesn't explain it. Nor th There are lies, actual lies, uh, that you can document in Marty's videos. For example, he, he said that the, um, after the Guardian's office was purged, that there were such tight prophylactic controls in place that you would never mess around with a judge. All right. That was in reference to Judge Swearinger in the Wollersheim case saying that his tires had been slashed, his dog had been drowned, he'd been followed. Yeah. Now, Judge Swearinger has no reason to lie. Right. And Marty said never happened. Yet in his own book, he, he talks about the Tishborn Christopherson case in Portland right. where, where they, Earl Cooley's um, junior law partner, got close to Judge Launder. Marty mm -hmm. documents this in his own book. Marty also, in a deposition in Victoria Britain's lawsuit, talks about how the church set about to interfere with the judge in the McPherson case, tried to get close to the judge, tried to get close to the police, tried to, right. s tried to save point. They also got close to the City of London police, they're close to LAPD. So Scientology has a documented history of trying to influence the outcome of trials, of legislation, and so on. And for Marty to say never happened when in a deposition he said it did. Right. This is, he's, he's starting to get into some, I think, dangerous areas for himself personally. Yeah. Because he's, he's putting out contradictions. To your point, you know, when he first left the church, uh, my wife was very generous with him financially. Right. Now, he's attacked her, so he, he's obviously a backstabber. Yeah. Now, if he feels he's setting the record straight about what goes on in the world of critics, he's not. Be be and I'll tell you why. Out in the world of being critics, and I've been, I'm an old guard critic. I've been around since 2005, even earlier on uh, ARS. Um, there's a spectrum out, about, out here of people who, who are, believe the tech can be useful to people who think it's complete and utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. So it's a big spectrum. He says he generalizes. I mean, to use a Scientology word, he's a generality infested person. Not the whole community out here doesn't think there's nothing to Scientology. In fact, we think there's something quite substantial to it and something quite dangerous to it. And most people can split the difference saying, look, if you get help through auditing, then get it. Uh, just as a civil rights issue, no one's opposed to anyone getting auditing. We are opposed to the human rights abuses, the financial predation, the lies, the brutality, right. disconnection, fair game. What struck me is Marty is attempting to normalize the deviancy of Scientology disconnection. In his video, he said, when someone refuses to reform, <laughs> that means when they refuse to obey Scientology. Yeah. He has demonstrated zero credibility. It, I mean, he's contradicting his own 
testimony. He's contradicting his own sworn statements. He's contradicting. He has hundreds and hundreds of blog posts up on his blog that contradict pretty much everything he's saying right now. You know, I wish we had a bit more information about what happened um, right around the time before he dropped his lawsuit. And again, I'm not. I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, time has been going by so fast. Uh, the, recently, I'm not going to be able to uh, name this date. The, leading up to the going, the release of Going Clear, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to tell uh, just a small little anecdote uh, to illustrate Marty just dropping completely out of the loop that he was supposed to be in. I was up in New York. Um, I had um, Mike had brought me with him as a guest to to go to a screening of Going Clear before it was released up in New York, and I was hoping to meet Marty. I'd never met, I've actually never met Marty Rathbun in person before. I've seen him in, in at Flag. Like, I have never spoken to Marty Rathbun in person before. And I was hoping to meet him. And Mike was expecting him to be there. And, and Marty was expected to be there for the screening, as a, you know, from the production company, to do, you know, like a Q&A or something like this. Sure. And we get to the hotel, and Mike texts Marty, Hey, hey Marty, where are you at? When are you, when are you arriving? And Marty goes, Yeah, I changed my mind. I'm not coming. Like, no, no notice. This is Mike, who is, is the closest thing he's ever had to a best friend, you know? And didn't even bother informing him he wasn't making the trip to New York. Like, up, up into the, the entire day, we were expecting to actually meet up with him. We were like, we were asking where he was because we were going to go out to dinner. Yeah. And Marty's like, oh, yeah, I didn't come. I changed my mind. I didn't come. It's, it's just a small little example. It was right around that time, I think, when something started to change. Marty decided... Whatever was going on in Marty's life, whatever was going on with the church, he decided that the people who at that point in time were his friends and allies were no longer his friends and allies. I just wish we had more information about what it was that, that happened at that time. Until and unless we get more information, people will, will speculate. I, I have my own opinions about it. Things, you know, because when you start looking at the specific message he's giving – this is part of Marty's hypocrisy. He is a guy who's putting out a scripted narrative that complains about a fictional group called the ASC and complains about a scripted narrative. This is where, to me, it's phony and bogus. Marty is operating off a scripted narrative to complain right. about a scripted narrative. And, and, right. that, and that stands out to me as, okay, this is a designed disinformation campaign by the Office of Special Affairs. To me, it has all the forensic fingerprints of it. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, I'll tell you. So in, in the first few videos that Marty did, I know I said that in the first few videos, it at least sounded like he was speaking stuff he could personally believe. Um, but one of the things he said that really caught me off guard was, um, aside from introducing this, uh, this troika, who who is the secret management of the um, of a, yeah. I guess anyone who's left Scientology? He mentioned that the Bible of the anti Scientology cult, which again, I don't know how specifically he defines that. Is that the people of who reads Tony's blog? Is that the people who watch Leah's show? Like, am I part of the anti Scientology cult? I don't know, but he says the Bible of the anti Scientology cult is going clear. I was like, wait, what? I said, I haven't even read Going Clear. Like, like, people don't reference Going Clear. I mean, there were stories that were told in Going Clear, and, that, and those stories have been told. It doesn't have any relevance to anything that's happening. I, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I, I, um, I, I was the same way. Look, look ba ba back in, I, I want to say 2007, yeah. When Larry Wright was first writing his New Yorker article on the apostate about Paul Haggis, right, and that article would become the book Going Clear. Yeah, I, I talked to uh, Lawrence Wright, and you know I was uh, uh, he, he wanted some background information, so he was you know calling critics and he was calling other people to get information, and and I was struck by the thoroughness and the meticulousness of his research and his questions. Yeah. I was also a little bit intimidated because this guy has a Pulitzer Prize and he wrote The Looming Tower, a defining book on Al-Qaeda. Ah. Which I've got to tell you, that for him to write that took, took a lot of personal courage. Right. And uh, Lawrence writes the real thing. His father was a war hero, a real war hero. 
Right. Not a fake war hero like Ron Hubbard. So, yeah. so I know how meticulous he was. So for Marty to attack the thoroughness of Wright's research, which, which really enraged me. Because, because but, I, because, but Jeff, correct me if yeah, I'm wrong. Yeah. I, I believe one, like, this is why I said, at least in the first few videos, he was saying things that at least he could personally believe were true, is I believe there were some factual, albeit un, in, unimportant, errors in the book. Am I wrong? Well, yes and no. Let, let, let me put it this way. Here, here's how I see it. I read through the Church of Scientology's entire website called How Lawrence Wright Got It So Wrong. Yeah. And I went through, and, I, and I'm and i a drudge. I go through details, okay? Yeah. And the complaints they had about Lawrence Wright's work were trivial. And in, right. any, in any book you're going to get, they were trivial. They didn't alter or affect the substance of the book. Right. Having, but if, Marty, if Marty's a bit unhinged, I figured it, this is what was going through my mind in the first few videos. Okay, and I, and because I, I actually asked Mike, I don't mind saying this. I actually asked Mike. I was like, Mike, no one in the right mind would spend enough time comparing the movie to the book and coming up with lists of these minor insignificant discrepancies between the movie and the book. And Mike said, Oh no, Marty would. No, no, Marty did. I saw the copy of the book that Marty had where he was filling in the pages and the margins with the notes of everything in the book he had a problem with. He's like, no, no, Marty did that. <laughs> so I thought the church was just taking this unhinged person and using them for their own benefit. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I didn't think – I figured, okay, Marty's at least saying stuff that he believes, and the church is just using him for their own ends. And then it proceeded past that into just obviously reading a script from the church. Those are all good points. Now, going back to going, back to going clear – the book and the movie are two different vehicles. The, True. Mo the movie is based on the book. Two different vehicles. Now, Marty nitpicking Lawrence Wright. Okay, that happens. People nitpick, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could go into Dianetics and drive a truck through the errors in that book. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. So what Marty is ne trying to negate, he's not affirming anything. I want. I, first of all, he's not affirming anything. And he doesn't really have a central message except there's an enemy he's trying to handle. I mean, he, right. he reminds me of he, – he, he almost seems to have reverted to his Inspector General RTC role. Right. And he's laying down the law. I've watched his body language. He slices his hand downward as if he's the final authority. He's made his pronouncement. We are to listen to the uh, Inspector General. Mm -hmm. And then there's other times his, his body language, his eyes will go up to one side and his mouth will be open and there will be a pause, or what Scientologists call a calm lag. Mm -hmm. So his body language is even strange. But then, when he, but then it became more obvious when, to your point, he starts reading a script. Yeah. And he's reading off a script. At points he acts bored, and at points he trails off on his sentences. So, so it's, I'm not a psychologist. I don't pretend to make a psychological assessment of him other than I will give you my experience as a salesperson. 30 years I sold to CEOs, vice presidents, vice president of technology, often had to work with physicists, engineers, right? I did a lot of sales work where you sit and listen. Right. My, my considered opinion as a professional high-level corporate salesperson, if I were making a call and someone were talking to me with this body language, the first thing I thought after watching everything was, this guy's lying to me. I don't right. believe him. He's trying to get me to believe something even he doesn't believe. Yeah, it's an odd performance. You know, he's saying things that should be taken very seriously, and yet he kind of smirks and smiles at inappropriate times. Um, he says things that are very um, insulting and damning about Amy Scobie, and then, you know, cut, uh, you know edit cut to... Uh, you know, Amy's a friend of mine. I don't have a problem with her. I'm not trying to disparage anybody. It's like, well, that's exactly what you're doing. So, like, like there, it, there's not a consistent tone, a consistent emotion, a consistent message, a consistent sense of urgency. Like, it, it's not like, you know, if I sit down in front of my in front of my phone and record a video, it's like I, I have a consistent message and 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 a uniform emotionality to it that makes sense. 
whereas his is a little weird, you know. And this is the edited version. I mean, you have to wonder how they bit and piece this thing together. Aaron, not not to lose uh, our point about Marty saying going clear is the Bible of the ASC. Yeah, I, I want to go back onto that for a minute. Yeah. To say that a book is a Bible, it, 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 it it's a non sequitur. You know, it, it it's, was, a, it's a non sequitur, and yet it fits in with what the church would want its um, members to believe that this is all one big giant coordinated effort. Well, they're trying to make something like in the Church of Scientology, LRH, the writings of L. Ron Hubbard, are policy, and you operate off those. Yeah. Just for the sake of argument, there's nothing, there's no instruction given in going clear that you can operate a movement off of. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I can't like, if I, it's like if I need to, <laughs> if there were a membership organization for the ASC, it doesn't appear in going clear how to join, how to pay your dues, how to get your paycheck from Big Pharma. I mean, it's all ridiculous. <laughs> No, it's a good point. I guess I hadn't even given it that much thought. I assumed at the time that what he meant was these stories form a, a structure, a narrative that serve as the, the guiding narrative for what everyone is saying. But when I even give that just a moment's further thought, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, what are we all spending every day talking about Amy Scobie's story? Are we all talking about Sarah Goldberg? Are we all talking about Spanky Taylor? Are we all talking about Paul Haggis, Jason McGay? In what way is that book a Bible or guidepost for anything that's happening? It's not, like you said, it is a non sequitur. Well, yeah, of course, and it's not. Marty's trying to suggest that it's a meta narrative that right. guides our complete meta narrative, and right. it doesn't because watching Scientology, they they do screwball things, and it's always that their behavior is always evolving. They've always got a new story. They've always got a new crisis. So there's no meta narrative. What we do is watch comment and observe. We're not informed by some guiding principle. In fact, people argue out here. You're free to argue. Exactly. Say, I mean, that's a great point that like there isn't a narrative. And, and like and and who are these mouthpieces that we're talking about? Tony Ortega does it's I'm going to make an analogy here. Sure. I had someone say one time, uh, Julian Assange is a very credible source." I said Julian Assange isn't a source. He provides a platform for sources. That's how I view Tony Ortega and what he's doing. He's reporting. He's not creating narratives. He's telling, he's giving a platform for people to tell their stories. You know what I mean? Oh, exactly. Like, exactly. It, it's not possible for there to be a narrative. People are telling their own stories. And, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, my Scientology Money Project started out as me writing a few articles for Tony. And when I, when I found the $1.5 billion in Scientology uh, IRS 990s, that was like the genesis. But I needed Tony a as a platform that I could go to. Right. And, he, and he, Tony very generously supported me, and he allowed me to do guest, guest articles. Yeah. And that's how the Scientology Money Project got started. Because right. I, I, I write pieces, and, and because Tony has such such a great audience, I post them there, then I put them on my money project. Right. But this, this my articles, I'm an activist, okay? And I, I'm really clear, I'm an activist. I do not oppose the free practice of Scientology. I'm not stopping the delivery of Scientology organizations. If you want auditing, get it good. If you don't like it, fine. I don't care. My particular goal is to expose the human rights abuses and call for a revocation of Scientology's tax exemption. Yeah. Now, if there is uh, an overriding theme, it and, and it's and it's the drum beats really picked up is that Scientology should lose its tax exemption. Right. And you're not going to find it with inurement so much as illegality and public policy violations. Right. Breaking the law, human rights abuses. Yeah. They should lose it. So my response to Marty is you can say whatever you want. Throw all the mud you want, Marty. You know, you've shot your wad. It doesn't play. The ASC yeah. is something you made up just like you made up radical Scientology. He, right. he, he had that term on his blog, radical Scientology. Yeah. Okay, so he, he made this up. To go down a punch list of people you have to engage in character assassination against is a function of fair game. Yeah. Uh, 
so got it. Got what you need to do, Marty. You're on some task. It's some assignment. You feel you need to do it. The church has put you up on its website. There are demonstrable lies in what you're saying. You are operating off a scripted narrative. Yeah. So go for it, Marty. This is freedom of speech. That's right. Be my so guest. So let's look at it this way, Jeff. Let me know what you think about this. Yeah. Um, it's one thing if we try to um, make some sort of analytical sense of this entire thing, assuming that Marty is like the source point of what we're hearing right now. But let, let's take a look at it from another angle. Let, let's take a look at like the, the hate websites that the church promotes, right? Yeah. We, we, I think you and I agree, as do pretty much anyone who's ever looked at those sites. People go, who does the church think the audience is for these sites? You and I know that the intended audience for those websites is uh, our Scientologists and pretty much nobody else, right? right? Correct. Those sites are intended to prove to Scientologists that the Scientology principle, always attack, never defend, is uh, being applied. It's to demonstrate to them that LRH's principle that anyone who ever attacks Scientology has huge discreditable transgressions for which they could probably be jailed in this lifetime. Those websites are, are simply a message to Scientologists. Now, I think we're pretty much seeing that these videos might as well simply be another hate, hate website produced by the Church of Scientology. And if you, uh, th these videos, uh, who is the audience for these videos? It's not the world's media. Tony Ortega has already done a wonderful job of comparing Marty's current statements to his previous statements to show how he's contradicting his, himself. He's reversing himself. Any journalist is going to do the same thing. <laughs> no, no one's going to start using Marty Rathbun as, on, in the media as a source for Scientology, right? No. In so fact, who is the audience? The audience is still Scientologists. Oh. And Scientologists, I don't mind saying, aren't going to put in the mental effort required to ask themselves, was he lying then or is he lying now? Mm. Because all Scientologists are going to do is see that somebody who they've been being told is the ringleader of all of the Scientology critics. Like, that's what sci to, to Scientologists, that's who Marty Rathbun is. The church has been telling them for, I don't know, five, six, seven years now. Um, yeah, he was the kingpin. Years. The kingpin. Yeah, the church is telling them that he's the kingpin of all Scientology critics, and all the Scientologists are going to see is that the kingpin has reversed himself, and it therefore invalidates the entire movement. Oh. And that's, that's all they're trying to do, in my opinion. You know, Aaron, They I'm, don't I'm, care I'm, that their own websites contradict Marty. Currently, I'm glad you brought this up because I have a question I'm dying to ask. If the audience for Marty's videos are people who are still in the church, mm -hmm. describe to our listeners how they would be shown. Are they called into ethics or OSA and shown the videos, or what goes on? Hypothetically, what would go on? Private staff, private private staff meetings where videos are shown to the staff members. So, um, if if public Scientologists were to go to the ethics officer and inquire, they would be shown the videos in a private in a private viewing space. Um, I guarantee you, oh, this would be this would be too good. Um, it, that we're going to see uh, this current material used in future Freedom magazines. Oh, that mm. would be too that would be too good because someone like Tony would just take page by page the. The, uh, what, what the church has already said about Marty in their previous versions of freedom and compare it to anything they, they put in future versions of freedom. But the answer to your question is they would never just do a broad general showing to the public. It would be to the staff members, to the Sea Org members at staff meetings or special meetings called, and to, to public Scientologists as it comes up, um, either by the ethics officer or by um, a member in the Office of Special Affairs. So it's like, let me show you this. The kingpin himself has found out that this movement is blah, 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 blah. That's right. right. It's, it's really bad, and the kingpin himself turned, and he did it all by himself. Aaron, to Scientology's hate websites, I want to make a point. Uh, as a researcher, I, I go through all the hate websites. I've been through them thoroughly. And it's almost like dumpster diving at times. You feel kind of dirty, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's like intellectual dumpster diving. Oh, so take note. But going through it, you know, when they did the, the, the hate website on Ron Miscavige Sr., yeah. Okay, here was what I took away from that. In the Rathbun case, Rathbun's lawyers were arguing heatedly that Captain David Miscavige did not run the Church of Scientology. And they, <laughs> they, they painted him like some distant guy who, 
who worked for some little tiny department called RTC, and all he did was handle malicious semicolons. <laughs> you know, and he was like the ecclesiastical leader who cut ribbons. But other than that, he has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day operations of running the Church of Scientology. Now, people know that's a complete lie. But on the hate website on Ron Miscavige Sr., they had David Miscavige designing the kitchen at Gold Base, designing, right. <laughs> designing the apartments. I mean, the right. guy sets and looks at carpet swatches and tile samples for the ideal ah. orgs. He micromanages. Yeah, exactly. My question to you, Aaron, okay, you're running the Office of Special Affairs, okay? Just mentally put yourself there. Why does the church make the decision to keep up all the hate sites on Marty, calling him a violent psychopath, while hosting his videos? Well, I'm purely speculating. And sure, and who, that's all. This is who just, knows the right answer? Yeah. But it seems to me, if you recall, the reason I said everything that's happening right now with Marty makes much more sense if he didn't take any money mm. is because it was my view that he was exposed, he'd be exposing himself to tremendous liability yeah. if he projected or telegraphed that he had settled in any way or taken a deal with the church. So now you explained to me how you think that is incorrect or you think it is possible, not that it's incorrect, but that it would be very possible and very easy and impossible to prove for the church to structure a deal with Marty without his lawyers being able to find out. But so my, my original feeling on all this was the reason that Marty wouldn't take his, his, uh, his blog down and the church wouldn't take their hate website down is that it would just be too transparent. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the best I can come up with. It would just yeah. be too transparent and it would contribute to him that in their minds, it would actually make him less credible because if, if they take their hate website down and he takes his blog down, then it looks like he's absolutely done a deal and therefore is not credible. I think in their minds, he's, he's more credible if it looks like he hasn't made a deal with the church. That's a very intelligent summation. As an inference, okay, we're, we mm -hmm. are speculating. Oh, but I don't mind speculating. I, it's just that I, I've watched so much cable news that, you know, if you're watching a conservative channel, they don't want to speculate about anything related to conservatives, but they love speculating about liberals. And if you watch the liberal channels, they like to speculate. As soon as it comes to speculating about members of their own team, they, they say it's irresponsible. <laughs> so. well, that, well, well, that's a great point. Look, in corporate <laughs> life, we had to play what if, what if, what if all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, for like sure, we're we're going to sure. go, we're going after a ten million dollar deal. We've got to speculate and prepare. What if this happens? What if that happens? So, what I the message I'm putting out is. When you consider Marty Rathbun's videos, look at the church hate websites and ask yourself which, which story is Scientology sticking with? Is he a violent psychopath or is he a credible source? Right. In my mind, because the church has called Marty Rathbun a conjurer of lies, Marty has admitted to destroying evidence in the McPherson case, engaging in obstruction of justice. Yeah. I considered Marty credible when he powered out of nowhere in 2008 with real facts, real details, real reports from people, real documents. Right. He was amazing. You know, just a force of nature. Yeah. Why he becomes dark over time and turns, maybe he was angry that his, his wife was criticized. You know, maybe... Yeah, you know, but she was only criticized after he dropped the case. Well, or they dropped the case. But whatever, what, what I'm saying, for whatever reason altogether, he turns, and now he's turning on colleagues. Now, in the church, this would be called a flip-flopper. Yeah. Okay, now, Marty Blue, he left the church in 1992 three after tax exemption. Yes, yes. So he blew in 1993 and the church recovered him, gave him a two year sabbatical on the free winds where he learned to audit. Right. Okay. Now, does he blow after that or does he blow in 2004? Um, I, I'm, I'm not good with these dates like you and yeah. Tony are. Okay. Well, the point is he's, he's blown twice. Okay that we know about when in a church website that says that he left the church three times. Yeah, I'm aware of him having left three times. I'm just not aware of the dates. Okay, so he left the church three times. The final time, he didn't come back. Right. Now, so I was talking to a neurobiologist, okay? 
and I was talking to him about Marty. He follows Scientology. He's a friend of mine, right? Yeah. And I said, what's your take on it, doctor? The guy's the real thing. He says, well, you know, reversion is interesting. He said, Jeffrey, you grew up as a Christian in the Christian church. In some sense, you're hardwired to think along Christian lines, Judeo-Christian. Yeah. You know, you're hardwired to think in terms of Judeo-Christianity. He said, even though you don't think it's possible, you could become older and have a sudden health crisis or some disaster where you turn back to your faith right. that you knew as a young man. He goes, that's called reversion, and it happens frequently. He yeah. said, he said, in my opinion, and this is just, just an opinion of a guy who happens to be a neurobiologist. He's saying, when Marty was a young man, he was hardwired into Scientology. Stresses caused him to revert back to what he knows best, to a safe place. Mm-hmm. You know, that I'm just putting that out there, and I'm asking the scientists in our listening audience to comment on, you know, and the social scientists too, hard science social scientists, comment on what reversion is about. Because to me, you know, in, in Scientology and Narconon, uh, they use the term drug revert. Yeah. So if someone's on drugs, they revert to drugs. You're a drug revert. Sure. Whatever the story is, whatever Marty's motivation is altogether, my opinion is he's a major Scientology revert. That is, he's reverted to Scientology. So let me ask you this, though. Did you ask your um, – uh, is this a friend of yours that you're referring to, this expert? Yes. Um, I, the concept of what you're describing and the, and the circumstances in which it might occur uh, make perfect sense. But what were his thoughts on someone who goes through that process like two or three times? He, he's saying it's reversion. It, it, no, I know, but – but multiple times, like you have your faith, you lose your faith. You get your faith back, lo- you lose it again. You get it back, and then you lose it again. Like that's, I, I it's, well, it's, it's, it's got to be a something, something extra. Well, I did, I, I didn't, I didn't go to that level. Marty's going back and forth between Scientology, not wanting to be in Scientology, may suggest some different characteristic. I don't know. I've only met Marty a few times. I don't know the man. Other than when I met him, he was very warm and friendly. Yeah. And suddenly he's put a knife in my wife's back. And he did it. And I couldn't believe he did it to, to Amy Scoby. I know. I know. She, they, she, she, I mean, they were – Matt and Amy were big Marty supporters, very close to him. And they, you could read the, 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 the hurt, right? And, and that's – and again, we've covered this, and I don't mean to interrupt you. But that's where you – that's where any idea that he's speaking his own words goes out the window – He's – those people have done nothing to Marty. No. No, and, I, and I'm glad you made that point. Marty's doing I, – I feel what he has to do, and the fact that he stops and has these pauses and looks up, that communications lag, that gap of time, the looking away, to me, like I said earlier, is an indicator that he's going to have to say something he may not want to say or he doesn't really believe in. Because these videos, I'll tell you something at a very emotional level. These videos don't seem to be done with conviction. Right. He's not Marty. No, you're right. He's, he's not. Totally right. Well, he's not Marty in 2008 who could really stand and deliver on television and lay down the law. Right. This almost seems to use that term like he's phoning it in. Yeah. You know, he's he's doing some obligatory thing he has to do. So I don't see the conviction. I, I hear him and I watch him. And I did a little video where I, I chopped out, um, it's a 90 second video I'll post, where I chopped out what he's saying and only focused on his body language. That was actually really funny. <laughs> well, well it, it was funny, but if you watch it seriously, because I did it as a study in body language primarily. Yeah. If you saw someone with that kind of body language, so, so, so you know, just. And we were lucky in the bunker to have an expert on body language weigh in and talk about it. And speaking of body language, you know, when Monique Yingling, to change subjects for a minute, appeared on the last TV show, remember her excessive blinking? Yeah. I mean, that indicates she's not telling the truth, according to body language experts. She she was blinking excessively. So, Aaron, this stuff, I'll conclude this way. You can't make this stuff up. No. No. And it's what makes Scientology so damned interesting. Yeah, I agree. 
and it's also when they do a foot bullet, when they do something like this. But I would say, bottom line for me, these Marty videos reek of desperation. Yeah. And they're suspicious on their face because a lot of things don't add up. And uh, I agree with you completely. Well, maybe we'll hear from Marty himself uh, about Jeff and Aaron's video, that, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff and Aaron's yeah. podcast that he didn't like. You know, at least so far in his videos, the trash he's talking is about people he personally knows. So who was that? Amy and Mike and Robert Ombud a little yep. bit, uh, just out of nowhere. Um, uh, Jackson, uh, Gary, Gary Moorhead Jackson. Yep. But if he's actually going sequentially through the episodes of Leah Remini's show, the next one is not is about David Miscavige. Mm. And I think it has Jeff Hawkins on there and Tom DeVoc. So he knows those guys. Episode four... That's Mary Kahn. Marty Rathbun's never met Mary Kahn. Mary Kahn's when he lost her son, Sammy. So if Marty comes out with talking points against the public Scientologist he's never met, then they're not even trying to cover up the fact that he's reading church talking points. After Mary Kahn, uh, that's the one about David Miscavige, actually. And then after that one, it's Mark and Claire Headley. Now, he knows Mark and Claire. He could talk trash about them if he wanted to. And then after that, it's me. I've never met Marty Rathbun. Right. So, what's he going to say? Right. Well, I mean, he'll he'll uh, say he'll have something to say, and I suspect you're on the list. It does look like he's going down a checklist of people connected to Leah Remini's show, and I think that's because Leah Remini's show presents such a clear and present danger to the church, right? Because she's letting people tell their stories, right? And Marty's attack point that it's all scripted that it's all made up is so bogus. Yeah. I mean, how could he even claim to know? And I've said this on, on social media, but I'll say it here. Not only was the show not scripted, there weren't, I'm talking about my episode, there weren't even talking points. There wasn't even an email saying, here's what we'd like you to discuss. I, ne I did not meet or speak with Leah Remini until she pulled up in the car in my driveway with cameras rolling. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I saw and the episode, yeah. Yeah, and, and literally, like, reality TV in general does have a reputation, because it's true, of being scripted. This isn't reality TV. This is a docu-series. This is, this is not your typical reality TV, you know? Um, well, and, and I can tell you, I can concur with you. Karen and I were on Leah's, uh, one of Leah's episodes briefly. Yeah. You know, you go there, you get makeup, and then you go on, and I really didn't know what I was going to talk about. I didn't know what she was going to ask me, and, right. and and Mike was there, and I think they try to put you at ease. But the the the, the human emotion, the passion, the conviction that Lee is putting into her show stands in stark contrast to this rather dull series of of videos that Marty's making. He's not going to win an Emmy for his videos, in other words. And no, Leah, he's not. <laughs> and Leah may well win an Emmy. I hope she does. For her show. And I hope she does, too, because that's a vindication. Yeah. It's an absolute vindication. When Alex Gibney won three Emmys for Going Clear, it was a vindication of his work. Yeah, it really was. So so we'll see, Aaron. I really appreciate your time, and we'll see if the Inspector General RTC himself has a rebuke for us. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aaron... Thank you so much for, for being on the show today. As always, we love having you. Thank you, Jeff. You are the best. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.